from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're here to, uh, I'm here to introduce Mary Jane, Mary Jane Clark, whose latest book we were just talking about. Uh, it's set in Tuxedo Park, New York, and she was just mentioning a, a mansion that was uh, a setting, Pentimento, in the book. And she just uh, happened to connect with the actual owners of the house. And they just threw a big event for the book. Most of her books uh, are set in the world of broadcast news, a world that I know and my colleagues at The Post know pretty well, because a lot of the players are uh, competitive, uh, uh, familiar with intrigue, sharing the same canned air of a presidential campaign plane. Never quite sure of the motives, but that's what her books explore. Um, today, uh, we're also, she was also going to mention something about the book that she wrote in 2003 that changed all of newsrooms about the, uh, the threat of an anthrax attack. Uh, it changed actually the way I received the books from Amazon. There's a, in, our, in our own mail room, there's a, there's a whole chamber where, where, the world, where our newsrooms are protected from these kinds of threats. And readers can explore them through her fiction. And I welcome today Mary Jane Clark. Thank you, Ned, for that kind introduction. Um, I guess I could try to act like it's no big deal to be here today, but I have to tell you, it's a tremendously big deal. And when I was... And when I was invited to participate, I was thrilled not only to be included with all the formidable writers who are here, but because this is the National Book Festival. And I'm so very, very honored to be here. It's especially wonderful to see in a world where there's so much, so many dire predictions about the future of publishing, how many people have turned out to celebrate books. You all have very busy lives. And there's a lot of other things you could have been doing today. So I thank you for being here. I've been asked to speak for a while about my background and experiences and how these books came to be. And then I really look forward to answering your questions and hearing what you want to talk about. Many writers say they were born storytellers and that they always knew they wanted to write. That was not the case for me. My path to suspense writing was not a straight one, but it's funny how one thing in life leads to another, isn't it? how seemingly random, unconnected events can lead to you to some places that you never would have expected to go. But how does someone become a mystery and suspense writer? How do you learn to think like a killer? How do you learn to be diabolical and evil and twisted? It's not something you pick up in Immaculate Heart Academy. But I can attest it's a lot of fun to decide who to kill, how to kill, and where to dispose of the body. You can work out a lot of aggression that way. In my life, criminal activity was involved pretty much from the start. In fact, you could say crime was responsible for my conception. You see, my parents met and married while they were both working for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. My family lived in Northern Virginia when I was very young, while my father, an FBI agent, was going to school here in Washington to learn to speak Russian. It was the height of the Cold War, and after he had learned enough of the language to do what he needed to do, which we can assume might have had something to do with listening to wiretapped conversations, my father was transferred to the New York City office where he tracked Soviet spies at the United Nations. He never talked about his work, but I remember the gun in his bureau drawer and the slight air of danger about him as he went on surveillance assignments at night. So I think it's fair to say that there was some sense of intrigue and suspense as I grew up. I suspect that may have played a part in my journey to suspense writing. But in fourth grade, the event that rocked the world ended up plotting my own course. 
President Kennedy was assassinated, and like the rest of the nation, I was transfixed by the images on television over those four dark days. I think that's when the dice was cast for me. From that moment forward, I knew I wanted to work in television news. And I did, from college graduation until just two years ago, I worked at CBS News in New York, starting as a desk assistant in the newsroom and ending up as a producer and writer. So before trying my hand at suspense writing, I'd written nonfiction for years in the form of television news stories, distilling the facts to their essence and carefully choosing what to include and what to leave out because of strict time, uh, time limitations. Telling a complicated story in a minute and 30 seconds and making every word count. I loved working at CBS News. For three, day, three decades, going to work, never knowing what each day would bring, being privileged and paid to watch history as it was being made, and having a job that exposed me to some pretty amazing things that showed me that truth can be stranger than fiction. In the meantime, I had gotten married and had two children. My daughter Elizabeth is here today. And shortly, and I had a son, and shortly after he was born, my second child, David, we found out that he had something called Fragile X Syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of Fragile X Syndrome? Well, it's, for those of you who haven't, it's the most common form of inherited mental impairment. And I unknowingly carried the gene and passed it on to him. And within a year, my marriage dissolved. But here's the thing. When the really good, the, this is the really good and unexpected thing that came out of that, when that period of my life came, when I felt like everything was spinning out of control, and the idea, the idea of writing a book and getting it published became a lifeline. Aside from the dream of achieving financial security, writing provided therapy, something I could concentrate on, something I could control, I had the power to make everything come out all right, or not, but I decided what happened on the written page in direct opposition to the upheaval in my world. They say you should write what you know, and I turned for inspiration to my years in broadcast journalism, creating a fictional television news world where the characters get into all sorts of suspenseful situations the reporters and, key, and producers of Key News, my imagined network, go out, cover their stories, and what they can get involved in pretty well knows no bounds. All of the characters have personal lives and challenges as well, and those ultimately influence the story. The most common question I'm asked is, where do you get your ideas? There are papers circulating out there with you today that list the books and give a brief description of each one. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that there would be this many people here, and I brought uh, you know, about 250 or 300, but th all of this information is on maryjaneclark.com if you wanted to look at it later. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the books, but let me share with you how the first came, few came to be so you get a sense of where the ideas come from. If you start at the last entry, that's the first book, and that's Do You Want to Know a Secret? That idea came during the Republican National Convention in 1992. And at the time, that was the time of Bill Clinton and Jennifer Flowers. And so there was a lot of talk in the news about the presidential candidates and, and uh, fooling around on their wives. So I started to think, what if it was the wife who was doing the philandering? And what if she was philandering with the network newsman? and actually the network news anchorman. And that was the big premise of Do You Want to Know a Secret? In writing that book, my, my children were very little. And it took, so I'd write at night or when they were with their father or before they got up in the morning. And um, it took me two years to write the book, two years to rewrite the book, and then it sat on a shelf for two more years until I got an agent who took me on and she sold it in two weeks. So it was an overnight success in six years. 
Um, the title, do you want, it took so long to get that book together that I had another original title that I worked with and I thought this was the best idea. I was going to use this title and then I had a series of other titles that would come off that title. And one day I was walking past a bookstore, I think it was a Borders, and I looked in the window and I saw a book and someone had stolen my title. It was James Patterson, Along Came a Spider. So I know he's coming after me and uh, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. So instead of doing a whole um, nursery rhyme series, which he so brilliantly did, um, the books say, pick, some, pick a title that resonates. And so I thought, do you want to know a secret? Sounds, you know, if you know the Beatles, it certainly resonates. And if you don't know the Beatles, if someone asks you, do you want to know a secret, you're most likely going to say yes. So it, hopefully that would bring you in. And that's how that's, that story, that book and title came to be. Do you promise not to tell came out of the fact that I had worked on a lot of auctions in New York. Um, at Sotheby's and Christie's. There was the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis estate sale, uh, the Duke and Duchess Windsor estate sale, the Princess Diana dress sale. So I just got very immersed in that auction world. And um, I also saw an exhibit of Fabergé eggs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I thought I would, it would be neat to do a story that incorporated both things. Uh, in that book, the FBI connection uh, came in very handy because my father's partner, when she retired from the FBI, became the head of security for Sotheby's in New York. And if you have any treasures that you think you want to sell, let me tell you, they're absolutely safe at Sotheby's because I wanted to kill someone in the auction house. And Margot, who, Dennedy, who was the um, head of security, took me on a tour to show me you know, how I, it could be done. But the fact of the matter was, we couldn't find a way to, for it to be done. There were security cameras everywhere in the cafeteria, outside the ladies' rooms in every hallway. And she took me downstairs to the basement where the items are stored before they go on the auction block. And my heart sank because I thought, I'm gonna rip, have to rip this whole book apart because it, there's no way to kill someone in the auction house. And I was shaking her hand, saying, saying goodbye and thanking her. And we were standing in front of the freight elevator door. And all of a sudden, the door opened, and inside there were no security cameras. So I had found my place to kill somebody. <laughs> um, let me whisper in your ear, drew from all the obituaries on the famous and infamous I had been assigned to when I was at CBS. What many people don't know is the obituaries of the famous are often put together well before they actually die. For example, all the presidents are done, as are all of their wives. Walter Cronkite's was done, and his obit was simply pulled off from the case and put on the, put on the air. Teddy Kennedy, Patrick Swayze, Farrah Fawcett were all done and ready to go because it was no secret they were likely to die. But Michael Jackson's was not, because his death was a complete surprise. This sounds kind of ghoulish at first, the idea of doing these obits before a person dies, but it's actually a very good thing. It takes a lot of work while to do all of the research and material gathering needed to complete an obituary for broadcast. And doing it in advance means that the person gets a more textured uh, well done portrayal of their life. I had written and produced many, many obits over the years, earning the dubious distinction in the newsroom of the angel of death. <laughs> the first one I was ever assigned was Rose Kennedy's, actually 20 years before she died. And it was updated several times to keep it current. Preparing that obit made sense. Mrs. Kennedy was elderly, but there were a few times when I just had a hunch that I should get a particular obit done. And when the person died shortly thereafter, my bosses shook their head and I was even surprised. So it occurred to me, what if an ambitious obituary producer 
was picking the obituary she worked on knowing that the subject was going to die because she was going to make sure that that happened. <laughs> that was the genesis of Let Me Whisper in Your Ear. And in Close to You, I had gone up to the office of a correspondent at CBS News and she was reading a letter from a man in Upper New York State who described to her in very graphic, horrible detail what he was going to do to her if she continued wearing her skirts too short. And it was really blood chilling. And I started to think, what kind of sick person would, write, would think of something like that, much less write something like that? But actually, the suspect pool was virtually limitless. Anyone with a television set could be watching a, a, someone on air and obsessing on them and, and anger building, building and thinking you know, horrible things about what they wanted to do to them. So I did some research on it, and it showed that a large percentage of female correspondents at one time or another receive this type of horrifying mail, and so do some men. But anyway, I knew there was a book in there somewhere. So you get the point. The ideas come from what's happened to me and what I see around me. The last three books have focused on the same four characters who work on Key to America, my highly rated morning news program. These four, Eliza Blake, who is the network, uh, the morning news anchor woman, and who's named after my daughter Elizabeth. <laughs> She'll hate me for saying that. Um, B.J. D'Elia, who is a cameraman in the book. Annabelle Murphy, who's a producer. And Margo Gonzalez, who's a psychiatrist, but also a key, um, key news contributor on the morning shows. They work together and they do dub themselves the Sunrise Suspense Society as the stories they cover lead them to solving crimes and suspense. When Daybreak came out, it came out because of all the hoopla when Katie Couric left NBC for CBS. That started a cascade of other news personnel changes and a lot of tension in the ranks. It only takes a moment was a story I was scared to write because it dealt with kidnapping. My father, after the Cold War ended, went on to investigate high-profile extortion and kidnapping cases. And I followed those cases in the newspaper on, on TV at a very impressionable age. So when I had my own kids, I think I was more afraid of kidnapping. A, a little bit, every mother and father are afraid of kidnapping, but I was obsessed with kidnapping to the point where I, I didn't want um, my daughter's picture in the newspaper went for the soccer team, you know, in the local paper. I just was afraid someone was going to steal her. But then my children grew up, and um, I'm not as afraid as much about someone stealing them. And my father was in his 80s, and I thought it was time to face my fear and talk to him about his cases and harvest his memories. His experience heavily influenced It Only Takes a Moment. And that brings us to my newest book, Dying for Mercy, which takes place in the exclusive and very privileged enclave of Tuxedo Park, New York. I've lived nearby, I had lived nearby as a kid and wondered what was behind the guardhouse and the gates. And then a very few years ago, I was invited to speak at a luncheon there. And once inside, what I saw took my breath away. Does anybody know about Tuxedo Park? Have anyone heard of a Tuxedo Park? It's a private park about 40 miles from Manhattan. And it was founded after the Civil War by Tobacco King Pierre Lorillard, who wanted to have a place his buddies and he could hunt and fish. It spread over thousands of acres in the Ramapo Mountains, and it is so incredibly beautiful, so lush, so exquisitely developed, with tranquil lakes and massive cottages, which are really mansions, carriage houses, boat houses, and gardens. It's fabulous. It's a privileged and protected world, rich in tradition and history. It has its own police force, and I was told that many of the residents don't lock their doors at night or take their keys out of the ignition. They feel totally secure. You see where I'm going? 
The idea of evil invading this rare and wonderful place fascinated me. Cell phone reception is spotty over the acres of mountains and rolling hills and lakes. The thought that it could be impossible to call for help if one were attacked or run off a winding road, that was one of the factors that made me excited about writing a suspense story that took place here. The second thing that happened that led to the book was reading an article in the New York Times about a couple who had done extensive restoration work on a giant New York City apartment. Unbeknownst to them, their architect designed and built a puzzle incorporating it into the renovations. It wasn't until years later, after the family moved, that they found the first clue. And that story intrigued me. And finally, a trip to Italy took me to Assisi, the home of St. Francis Assisi. I, it too is a stunning place with remarkable history and walking the streets that St. Francis walked and imagining what his life was like 800 years ago was so moving. I had learned about St. Francis in grammar school, yet honestly hadn't paid all that much attention. But in Assisi, his story came alive. And I was amazed, as pretty much anyone would be, at the goodness of the man and what he had done on earth. So I started to think and decided that Innes Wheelock, the permeating character in Dying for Mercy, would have walked the streets of Assisi, studied the life of St. Francis, and when examining his own life, realized that he had come up terribly short. Innes wants to repent and make himself over in the image of St. Francis. Inflicting stigmata upon himself is the ultimate attempt to become one with the saint. But before he dies, Innes also designs and incorporates a puzzle and builds it into his renovated mansion and other locations within Tuxedo Park, revealing other people who have done and, and or have been involved in very bad things. So that's how Dying for Mercy came to be. All 12 books stand on their own. You don't have to read them in order. The chapters are short, and I try to have many cliffhangers at the end of each one. Definitely influenced by my years of writing for TV, the prose has been called clear and speedy. My aim is to tell the reader what's important, get to the point, not pad things out with extraneous material. I think the relatively short chapters ratchet up the suspense and make you keep turning the pages. Because I know myself, if I'm reading a book in bed at night and I get to the end of one chapter and I look to the next, if it's 15 pages long, I'm closing the book and I'll, yeah, I'll go to the, wait till the next day. But if it's two or three pages, I keep going. And I think that's what you want in suspense. You want the reader to want to keep turning the pages. I'm often asked, of, are the characters people I knew at CBS? And the answer is no. I don't, when I was still working there through the first 10 books, I didn't want people running away from me in the hallway <laughs> when they saw me coming. Um, my mind is twisted enough, to, and I can think of my own sick characters. But um, having said that, of course I'm influenced by the things that I saw there, and um, they do, the culture permeates the story. Um, I will share one story about Dan Rather, though, and this is really for aspiring writers or anyone out there who has a dream. When I was uh, kind of thought I was at near the end of the first book, I made an appointment to talk to Dan, and I wanted to get some ideas. Actually, I wanted to see if he would write a letter of in introduction for me because I had done my research on agents, and I had three that I thought might be... Um, interested in, in representing me. Um, and I thought, what's going to make them just pick my book off the pile? And if I had this letter from Dan introducing me, that would be great. So I, we went in and we went to his office. And he proceeded to nicely but very firmly lay out all the hard things about publishing. He had done several books himself, how hard it is to get published, how hard it is to get an audience, you know, if the odds are really against you. But at the very end, he said to me, but you know, Mary Jane, lightning strikes. And I held on to that. And it did strike for me. It took a long time, 
but it has it has struck and I think that's what you have to remember if you if you want to be a writer or anything else forever if you if, you know anything else if you really want it keep believing in it and don't give up on it because lightning does strike in closing sometimes the things we read in the newspaper or see on evening news are worse than anything I could ever make up there's enough violence, enough gore out there already to the point where it doesn't even shock us much anymore. So for me, the challenge becomes telling a gripping story that doesn't depend on blood and guts to hook the reader. I try to tell a story that creates psychological suspense, but doesn't need to gross everyone out to succeed. In the end, my aim is to provide, provide riveting entertainment and a good puzzle. I want to be fair to you, give you a chance to figure things out, leave out, leaving all the clues scattered throughout the story, but laying them out in a way that you don't always notice them, only later realizing, aha, it was there all the time. So thank you very much for having me. And I spoke, I think I spoke too long, so I can just take a few questions. Um, and there, there are microphones either side there. Hi. Yes. Oh, my next book, actually the next book, I'm starting um, a new series. Um, I'm going to give Key News a little hiatus for a while. And um, it's not over, but I'm just taking a little break because I have this idea for another series and I really want, I really want to do it. But um, Key News will be back for, for certain. And that's the fun part of the researching any of the books is the ability to go to really great places and walk the streets and get the ideas. I, so many times uh, my ideas come from just walking the streets and from going into the restaurants and, and going into the places in a town. Um, so that's really, the research is the, is the most fun. But the Tuxedo Park research, I think, might have been the, the most fun research I've done so far. Definitely. Yes. Hi. I know it's Scott. Thanks, Scott. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, well, they all have been. Well, a few of them have been in New York. First of all, the, the question about Scott works at CBS News and he told me somebody else has picked up the angel of death mantle so life goes right on um, and yeah I definitely think they'll be outside of the New York City area because I, I want to go to other parts of the country I think the readers enjoy going to places they've never been before and yeah definitely good to see you. all right good to see you too Scott yes do you choose the locations of your appearances and where do you live in Florida and New Jersey? I live outside of New York City in a town called Hillsdale, although now that I said it, I shouldn't have said it because one time um, I opened my, my, there was a knock at my door and I opened it and there was this man standing on the steps and he was disheveled. I could tell things were not quite right. And um, as, it talk, as I talked to him, I found out he had been in Barnes & Noble, opened the book, on the back page, it said the town that I lived in. He looked me up in the phone book and came to my house. And he, he definitely had, you know, some mental illness issues. So um, after the next day, I got an unlisted phone number and got out of the phone book. And I've, since then, I just say I'm from New Jersey. And the other place in Sarasota, Florida. My publisher tells me where to go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I would go more places, but uh, they tell me where to go. Yes. What all do you do to help publicize your books? I do. I do. I do a lot of um, like the the, the the writing year. I would say really, it's only five months that I'm actually writing the book. The rest of the year, I'm researching the next book, thinking about the next book, and doing the promotion and the business of publishing. I think. Um, 
you know, it's very few writers who aren't out there talking to people, trying to get the word out about their book. So, you know, I, this year I was on Good Morning America. That was the first time I had ever been on that. And, and um, you know, I just try to do as whatever they ask me to do and, and try to, you know, do as much as I can. I don't say no, pretty much. Yeah. Is it time? Oh, it's time. Okay. Thank you very much for coming today. It was a pleasure being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.